Hello. Welcome to the continuing series on Bergson and his philosophy, his holographic theory of mind. This will be part 14. We'll be discussing the predictive processing framework, which is a current avant-garde cognitive science framework for viewing the mind. We'll be looking at a few of the major theorists like Andy Clark, Jacob Howey, Moshe Bar, the whole notion of downward information flows in the brain and suppression of upward input or input from the brain, from the, from the external world. The comparator notion that this involves versus the actual structure of events, the, the difficulty yet of explaining the image of the external world in this framework, and Bergson's own version of predictive processing based, of course, in this entirely different reconstructive wave, or brain as a reconstructive wave, passing through the holographic field model. So I'm going to begin with a set of notions taken from the book, The Predictive Mind, authored by Jacob Howey, 2013. Now, the pronunciation might be Howey, and if that's the true pronunciation, I apologize to Dr. Howey, but I'm going to stick with that pronunciation from henceforth. And so, as he notes, the predictive framework, or PP, takes its lead from its early originator, the great physicist Hermann Helmholtz. To quote, perceptions are regarded as similar to the predictive hypotheses of science, but are psychologically projected into external space and accepted as our most immediate reality. So already we see an interesting phrase, psychologically projected into an external space. And we're going to wonder what psychological projection means. Thus the problem of perception, how he argues at the start of his book, is this. How the right hypothesis about the world is shaped and selected. So given the Helmholtz framework, we're reformulating hypotheses. We have to select the right hypothesis about the world if that's what we're going to see, perceive and perceive correctly. So the brain is seen as manipulating a generative model of the world, an internal mirror of nature that recapitulates the causal structure of the world. Again, we're going to wonder, well, just what is this generative model? What does it look like? Is it like the many YouTubes that are out explaining perception where there's, as above in the top picture, virtually a little picture of the world inside the occipital area of the brain, a little vase is in the top picture, or a set of people rafting down the river as in the picture on the right? Or is it just the causal structure of the world, which is far more abstract, but is not necessarily a picture? He goes on, prediction error is minimized relative to the model's expected or hypothesized states. So these models that are going to be concerned to keep the match between the incoming data and the projected data as close as possible. Now if I slide over to another book by Andy Clark, Surfing Uncertainty in 2015, Again, pretty much the same as Howey. He notes that the PP framework is arguing that, that the, in the brain, there is both an upflow of information from the external world, from our external coffee cup being stirred, and most significantly, a downflow of predictive information. And the predictive information flow, our, our green arrow there, actually has priority or suppresses the upflow. Though this priority is constrained by the degree of error in the match between the two flows. So in other words, if there's a significant difference between the two flows, then the upflow retains its superiority or priority. 
The predictions in this neural network or computational framework are in essence probabilistic Bayesian priors. Now, I'm not going to go much into Bayes' theorem. One only needs to know for our purposes here that we're talking a probabilistic framework of prediction and, and computing the, in other words, the probability of that prediction being true. In one of the significant developments Clark describes, networks and algorithms are being created that learn these priors from the incoming information, thus solving an important bootstrap problem as to how the predictive process actually gets going. So in other words, what's being said there is somehow I have to form an hypothesis that I'm seeing a coffee cup being stirred initially. I have to have some ability to form that prior about the probability of perceiving a coffee cup being stirred. And, and so I've got a bootstrap problem as to how I get going. How do I lift myself up on my bootstraps? Uh, and so the significance here, as Clark is describing in his book, is that there is progress being made on actually learning these priors. Now note the inversionary twist. Perceptual influence is always trying to use its prior knowledge to predict and suppress, yes, I repeat, suppress the sensory input the system is receiving. So thus, rather than the bottom-up data received from the external world, namely the coffee cup on the left, being used as the material to create the perception, it is the predictive model best fitting or minimizing the error that is actually perceived. Now, by implication, that would be the coffee cup on the top right that's actually being perceived. And one instantly sees the strange dilemma that predictive processing is in because one has to ask then where and what type of error and how far that error must be from the input before we actually see the input. This becomes I suspect, a very subtle tuning problem, I would, I would presume. Further, what would this internal predictive model actually look like, embodied as it must be in chemical flows? How could it possibly look in the brain like my experience of the kitchen with its tables, its chairs, and my hand with a spoon stirring coffee in, the, in a cup on the table? And then again, how is this internal model psychologically projected? What does that mean? I mean, this is one of these phrases that's thrown out there that has no particular meaning assignable to it. Psychologically projected. What the heck does this mean? It's, we've certainly gone beyond any physical model. So that is, how from this internal neural-based hypothesis do we obtain an image of the external world? Because we know there is not one as such in the brain. These are questions one instantly and impatiently presumes that Howie, for example, in his book, will quickly deliver on. In other words, we're hoping that we can explain the magic that has to happen to get that image of the coffee cup out of the brain and into the external world. But in, in an unfortunate structural aspect of the book, we waited until about 200 pages in to hit this, this disclaimer from Howie. Quote, this is not intended as a proposal that can explain why perceptual states are phenomenally conscious rather than not. And that this is merely, quote, a proposal that describes the states that are conscious via those representations of the world that currently best predict the sensory input. 
and that it, quote, does not intend to touch the hard problem, unquote, which is to say Chalmers' hard problem of consciousness. So this is rather disappointing because we find that all he's really saying there is he has a proposal that is claiming that the states that are conscious are, are so via the predictive hypothesis, the downward flow, but he can't explain why those become the image of the external world. And so one wonders, but, but what happened to the predictive hypotheses of science that are psychologically projected into external space and accepted as our most immediate reality. So apparently the magic can't be delivered on. So clearly this predictive processing slash Bayesian framework is at best a partial answer. It is a computational piece of the puzzle, but just a computational piece. That is, there's no true concrete dynamics involved, where again, by concrete dynamics, I mean a dynamics as concrete as that of an alternating current motor generating a field of force. Computations alone cannot account for consciousness. But again, that's all that the PP framework is actually offering. So for anyone just coming into the, into the series that happened to jump right in here, you'll have to check out parts one, two, and three, or at least part one, to see Bergson's answer with Gibson thrown in for part two and part three to complete it on the origin of the image of the external world, on the origin of that coffee cup. It's a quite a different model than the PP framework, and it is a real concrete dynamics that's being invoked, not just computation. Clark is well aware that this framework is no solution to the problem of perception, that is to the origin of the image of the external world. We have two neural or chemical neural flows up and down, neither of which look like Clark's example coffee cup on the kitchen table. Clark uses the coffee cup too. Just like that is like our experience of the external world. The down flowing prior for a coffee cup, the green arrow, is nevertheless only neural firings. So again, we're invoking a interesting form of magic to get something that looks like the coffee cup out of that downward neural flow whether we call it a predictive Bayesian prior or not. So he chides Howie for arguing that this framework can indeed explain the origin of our experience, as Howie invokes the notion that from these flows emerges a virtual image of the coffee cup and table. Now, I did not see that in Howie's predictive mind book. As we just saw around page 200, he explicitly denies that he can explain anything. However, we definitely saw language like that in terms of psychological projections, etc. If Clark tends to sin is that he slips continually into overenthusiastic language. For example, he'll say PP is, quote, a compelling cognitive package deal in which perception, imagination, understanding, reasoning and action are co-emergent. But if one has no theory of the origin of our image of the external world, one wonders how can one claim a theory of perception? And given no theory of perception, then a theory of memory, that is of how this perceived experience is stored, is ungrounded. And indeed there is no accepted theory. And given this, how can we be saying that we are actually explaining imagination, which is to say just another form of cognition, something which relies on invoking this experience? Howie and the predictive processing framework in general is in the same boat, that is when it comes to cognition. 
That is, they really have no grounding for a theory of cognition because they have a non-starter theory in terms of explaining the perception of the world, of the external image, the image of the external world. But he yet tries to take the framework into explaining Churl's, Searle's Chinese room. If you remember, Searle was in a room and he was receiving Chinese linguistic strings as input and simply acting as a computer using syntax rules was creating Chinese output. And of course, he was arguing that in this process, there was no comprehension of Chinese whatsoever arising in Searle's mind. But Howie is trying to say that he can take a Bayesian network and account for the conscious understanding of an event which is created via the mediating device of a string of linguistic symbols. So when I say the man stirred the coffee with the spoon, I am using language as a mediating device, a string of symbols to create an event in the mind. If I'm not creating an event, I have no understanding of that sentence. I'm creating an event, I'm describing an event of the man stirring coffee with the spoon. So how, however, does not acknowledge that beneath the sentence created event perception lies the same difficulty as that beneath, beneath the hard problem. That is, in the hard problem, I'm explaining the origin of the image of the kitchen, chairs, and coffee stirring spoon. And I'm trying to do the same thing with my linguistic string, the man stirred the coffee with the spoon. I've got the same problem. So how he thinks he's going to use his Bayesian network to solve the comprehension problem in Searle's Chinese room when you can't explain perception is beyond me. How he describes the earlier mention causal structure of the world, which are captured or recapitulated in these Bayesian hypotheses of priors, in terms of invariance in his terms, regularities that exist over various scales of time. But the discussion of these is very abstract. The concept of invariance seeming very limited, almost entirely in terms of, as he says, causal regularities. For example, dropping an egg to the floor results in or implies a broken egg. Or stirring coffee and cream results in the cream and the coffee get, get mixed. But these are virtually simply if-then logic rules. If I drop an egg, the egg will break. If I stir the coffee and cream, then the coffee and cream get mixed. Neither of these describes the actual dynamic structure of the event of egg breaking or coffee stirring. And missing is any reference to ecological psychology and J.J. Gibson, a discipline where the irregularities have a precise mathematical structure. And as I noted in parts two and four and several other places, but we have to go through it again, events have a dynamic time extended invariant structure. Our little coffee stirring event there has an adiabotic ratio, that is an energy of oscillation over frequency of oscillation. It has an inertial tensor, which where the tensor, the moment the terms of the tensor involve the angular momenta of the spoon. There's a radial flow field defined over that surface. The cup size constancy as it moves back and forth, or as our head moves back and forth, is a ratio of the height of the cup to the texture gradient over which the cup moves. Even the form of the cup is a function of flow fields with velocity gradients. And this is just the beginning of the list of invariance laws that define this event of coffee stirring. All of these, the flow fields, the inertial tensors, the adiabatic ratios, etc., comprise the structure, what I call the structure of invariance, or invariance structure defining the, this little event of coffee stirring. It is a structure where the invariants are defined over time. 
an extended flowing time. And as Gibson argued, these invariants cannot exist in an instant or be transmitted as bits over the nerves. But it is this dynamic structure that is arriving in the brain as the bottom-up information to be compared against a predictive hypothesis and suppressed. And so it is this very same dynamic structure that would have to be incorporated within and would have to define the predictive hypothesis of this stirring event that is being projected as our experience. So what I'm saying is the input is a very dynamic structure of invariance. We've incorporated invariance laws defined over time over concrete dynamics and forces. That's the external event. But the projected hypothesis, the little coffee stirring on the left there in the, in the brain diagram, would have to be equally as complex to match, even come close to matching that external event. It would have to hold the same invariant structure. So now you have to conceive of the comparison process as the clash of invariant structures and to see who wins. Because remember, in the PP framework, it's supposedly the predictive hypothesis that always wins if, if the error isn't too much, which is becoming obviously an extremely interesting question as to what that possibly means. And notice, you know, my little predictive hypothesis there is just one of many in that line of possible events of coffee stirring, which one is being selected, which one is matching. I mean, just that picture alone begins to give an index of how difficult the task of the predictive processing framework actually is. That picture kind of says it all. Which one is the predictive hypothesis? And why would it ever match? Unless it's exactly the same event. But why would that ever be? So the predictive modelers actually avoid this nicely because they live in a static world. It is a world of snapshots. That is, they live in the world of the classic metaphysic, as we described in the previous parts, with its abstract time. So in the comparator model, in my diagram at the top there, I have the external world. And I take a snapshot of that stirring. I pass it through my comparator. And if there's a match, and I'm comparing it to my predicted snapshot, and if there's a match, I continue projecting the predictive hypothesis. And then this, of course, this is a nice loop that continues. And I take another snapshot, compare it to the next predicted snapshot. If match, continue with my predictive hypothesis. If the match is too divergent, if there isn't a match, if the discrepancy is too divergent, supposedly the picture on the left wins. But we know snapshots cannot work. Remember the rotating wire cubes of we talked about in part two, which were we strobed them, we strobed the cube, we had a rotating wire cube, and I strobed it in phase with its symmetry period. And when it strobed in, so we had really one, um, one cube here. If we strobe it in phase with a symmetry period, that is an at an integral multiple of that period with, where the period is four, so eight times a second, 12 times a second, we see a rigid cube in rotation. But if we strobe that cube out of phase, out of phase with a symmetry period, remember symmetry period is four times per revolution, and out of phase strobe would be 13 or 17 times, a plastic, non-rigid, wobbly, not a cube is specified. So the strobe is effectively a snapshot 
a sample of the event. But sampling out of phase destroys the rigidity or the cubeness of the cube. So to take a, take a snapshot of the rotating cube to compare and yet see a rigid cube in rotation, what would the comparator have to know? Well, the comparator would have to pre-know the symmetry period of the cube, first of all. It has to pre-know the symmetry period of the object it's looking at. It would have to know, and this is where it gets truly interesting again, via ESP, precognition, the exact rate of the sampling. It, would, it, ha it, has, to, it has to sample precisely with, within that symmetry period, four times a revolution, eight times a revolution. And what if there were two or three cubes rotating at different rates, which certainly we can see? Then how would the uh, comparator ever match up all these different cubes at different rates? And then remember the rotating ellipse. Now, Weiss, Simoncelli, and Adelson were also using Bayesian priors. And their constraint or prior in their model for motion for perception is motion is slow and smooth. Too rapid a rotation violates this constraint. So if I'm rotating that ellipse, and that ellipse, the edge, that surface, that perimeter can be seen as a whole set of velocity vectors. And so if I rotate too quickly, I violate this constraint, and I get a non-rigid wobbly ellipse. And I noted that the out-of-phase strobe is possibly also violating the constraint. For example, it could be spatial regularity implies temporal regularity. So if I imagine a rotating cube with a light in the center of each side, it would, it would uh, emit a regular temporal pulse. In an irregular polygon, like my, my irregular pentagon rotating there on the left, would emit an irregular pulse. So just a possibility for the constraint that's being violated in the strobe rotating wire cube. But Weiss and all, Weiss and all constraint, their motion is slow and smooth constraint, is simply turned into a mathematical constraint that is applied to velocity flows. That is, it's a math constraint applied to processing velocity flows due to their inherent uncertainty. And I noted all the various flows that exist here. We have a, a velocity flow as we drive toward the sun. We have the, the velocity flows defined over the sides of the rotating cube, where the, the edges of the cube, the vertices, sh simply become sh sharp discontinuities at the junctures of these flows. Similarly, for the, we have velocity flows defining the rotating ellipse. All of these are inherently involving uncertainty due to another difficulty, two, two different difficulties I describe. And this is why Weiss et al. also moved to probabilistic constraints to, to compute motion. So this computation that Weiss et al. are talking about can easily be seen as incorporated in the brain as a reconstructive wave. It's part of the brain's optimal specification. As Weiss et al. argued, all events are optimal specifications due to the inherent probabilistic nature of this processing. So that we have an optical specification of the cube or the ellipse. But it is not a predictive hypothesis. That it is not an hypothesis like I am seeing a rigid ellipse. It is not a suppression of input. It is not trying to compare 
states in an ongoing dynamic velocity flow. It's not our comparator. It is not at all the same as in the PP framework. Again, when I say it is not a predictive hypothesis, for example, it's not an hypothesis like a rigid ellipse or a flowing coffee cup or whatever. So by the time a comparison would be made between two hypotheses, a rigid ellipse versus a floppy ellipse, the shooting is already over because the floppy non-rigid non -rigid ellipse is already specified. It's already an optimal specification. So the predictive hypothesis concept here is utterly redundant. That is, it's useless. The same is true for the wobbly plastic knot cube that's being strobed out of phase. It is already an optimal specification. There's no question here of comparing an hypothesis of uh, that I'm, I've got an hypothesis of a rigid rotating cube and it's not matching. Therefore, the arrhythmic cube wins. This, the the plastic knot cube, plastic wobbly cube, it's already an optimal specification. The whole notion of the predictive hypothesis winning is redundant in this case. In fact, useless, as I said. So back to coffee stirring. What would the matching or comparison process, comparison process of these two dynamic structures, the hypothesis versus the invariant structure of the dynamically external changing event, namely the coffee stirring, possibly look like, as I've already indicated. How are such structures, which are intrinsically dynamic flows, stored in the brain? For, for, for PP, they have to be stored because, well, that's their model. All this is stored in the brain and, and then somehow created instantly in real time over and over again as a hypothesis. But how can that be? How, how are they stored? How are such events retrieved memory-wise to become an hypothesis? I mean, these are just fundamental questions sitting there in this PP framework. But I go back to the first bullet. What, how in heck would this matching process actually work in real time over these dynamic flows? I mean, I could not possibly work it out. So let's go back to Bergson for a second. Bergson also has a form of hypothesis matching or his own form of predictive processing. It involves the continuous projection of memories into the present perception. And I put projection in quotes. I'm walking along in the woods. I see a bear, barely clearly see a bear. I stop and stare, but it's only a tree stump. It was, only, it was only a small bear. Or I hear a popular song. Initially, the words are only a confusion. They're indistinct. But as I learn the words, either by listening many times or cheating and find, finding the text, from thence on, the song is clear. Now for Bergson, memories are in a continuous circuit filling in the present perception. Note this is already a form of the famous filling in concept that Dennett made famous. Now why is this? Because we, that is the body and brain, are embedded in the 4D holographic field and the brain is in a continuous modulation pattern. So it's specifying both the present in terms of virtual action, the coffee cup, for example, and aspects of the past of experience that resonate with the same structure. So aspects of previous coffee stirrings. Now, this is not a projection outward into the external world. That is, we're not projecting neural stuff outward that magically transform into the external world as a coffee cup. 
Rather, what we have is a simultaneous specification of the 4D field of the immediate past, namely the coffee cup or the fly buzzing by, and of aspects of the distant past also present in that field. So all perception is already memory. The, the fly buzzing by is already memory in the first place. Remember, it's a specification of past states of the, of the field, or past, a portion of the past transformation of the field. And there's nothing preventing in the 4D holographic field aspects of the past to be mingled in. For Bergson, this mechanism is an entirely ecological and evolutionary necessity. If I'm walking in the woods with my stone axe or club and, and I see a saber-toothed tiger, I'd better be ready to react. That is, perception must be interlaced, interlaced with past experience. It's just ecologically necessary. It's evolutionarily necessary. But we must ask, do I really want a process like PP that gradually learns priors? such that eventually we may see a saber tooth, even though it is just a stump, just a tree stump. I submit that Bergson's predictive processing is actually more plausible. And I say that especially when you factor in all the other things that Bergson actually explains that PP does not. We're starting with an actual model of the image of the external world. Bergson built his model of language understanding upon this circuit. He argued that as we listen to someone speak, there is created a motor diagram of the speech because we as the body know what the, our, the uh, interlocutor is taking, is requiring via his body and articulatory apparatus to create that speech. So it's like a motor schema of the speaker's articulation of the words. Now, this was echoed and extended later in, in Lieberman's motor theory of speech perception, which is a very powerful theory of speech perception and still exists today. The, the memories of the language, the words pour in to consciousness to fill this diagram, this motor diagram. This is what makes the speech stream distinct, just like the words from the song became distinct. But it's not just the acoustic memories of the words that pour in, so to speak. Behind this is the entirety of the mind, of our experience. Our experience is in four, in, in 4D memory of coffee stirring, or canoeing, or baking cakes. So the speaker at the kitchen table says, Joe is stirring the coffee with a spoon. For Bergson, I am placing myself symmetrically to the speaker. I'm already placing myself in the kitchen slash eating slash coffee context, or in the canoeing context, or in the farm context, depending on what is being discussed. I already have memory, I already have my redintegrative powers tuned to the event, to, to pour in the experience, so to speak, of coffee stirring, or of eating at the table. All this then can come to fill in the motor diagram with the correct words to make the sentence heard clearly and comprehended. So behind the sentence comprehension is the entire mind, all of our 4D experience. Now this is an amazing concept and profound concept. And I, I don't know how many listeners have ever experienced LSD, but 
in my two experiences, what one experiences when one listens to language is just reverberation of meaning that seems to go on forever. And I think it's precisely because this is entirely the case. The entire mind and all of your experience is be actually behind the sentence comprehension. Be it as simple as Joe is stirring the coffee with the spoon. So now we see what a profoundly different process is language comprehension, how profoundly different from AI's conception, from cognitive science's conception. It's not just AI's failure to handle analogy that is the problem. It is this entire conception that must be in place. This conception of the brain having access to the entirety of 4D memory that must be concretely Im implemented. So this is simultaneously how profoundly different the true predictive processing might actually be. But AI and cognitive science will simply spin their wheels, I'm afraid. Why? Because look at where they have to move. They'd have, they'd have to move to the 4D nature of the world. They'd have to move to Bergson's temporal metaphysic with its inherent indivisibility of motion. They'd have to move to the origin of the image of the external world as being explained by the brain as a reconstructive wave passing through the holographic field. They'd have to understand and accept the very existence of images and for dimensional being. And they'd have to come to the idea that the abstract is defined upon the concrete. It does not exist without the concrete and thus requires the retention of all concrete experience. Bergson's model is in fact, I think the far more logical and without this AI and cognitive science, well, I'm saying is stuck, but they'll make illusory progress and for a long time. So let me go back to the Chinese room for a second. Searle, had argued that mere syntax manipulation, mere rule manipulation and symbols cannot account for linguistic comprehension. Succinctly, syntax is not sufficient for semantics. Now this caused a storm in cognitive science. For one theorist, Hayes, McCarthy and Hayes being behind the frame problem, cognitive science should be defined as, quote, the ongoing research program of showing Searle's Chinese room argument to be false. The argument being that significant because Searle was taking aim at the entire syntax manipulation, rule manipulation structure of symbolic programming. And this includes as well neural networks. The difficulty is Searle had no model of semantics or comprehension or perception for that matter. He left a vacuum and it, was, it wasn't just he, he was simply participating or expressive of the vacuum that in general existed. But since the vacuum exists, this is why PP theorists like Howe still think they can fill it. We have seen what comprehension requires. Just for starters, invariant structures defined over time, forces and flowing fields, the retention of the entirety of concrete experience, the body brain embedded in the visible transformation of the holographic field, as we've just said. This is why syntax will not suffice. All of this is required, but this positive model simply doesn't exist. So the vacuum begins with a huge lacuna or lack of, lack of in our understanding of the structure of events, as we've been discussing. It supports the notion, this vacuum does, as even Hofstetter and Sander did in their Surfaces and Essence books, that events must be perceived, distilled, and stored. 
This distillation concept expresses the theme of an, of an encoding of an abstract structure of event of the event, the parsing into elements or features of the whole event, which are then stored and reassembled. So I take my coffee cup and I break it into as many little pieces as I can think of my coffee stirring. And these are all stored as aspects, features, elements of the event. But Hofstetter and Sander are repeating the essence of a major position in the theory of memory, namely the abstractionist philosophy of memory storage. That is, perception events inherently must be reduced and stored as schematizations. Only selected elements or abstracted elements are stored. So back to the PP framework, in Barr's version of, of the predictive framework, this reduction is termed the gist of events, where the brain can, to quote Barr, encode in memory only a reduced gist-based version of actual memories, because these details can later be reconstructed with sufficient resolution. As I noted earlier, I think in part four, Barcelo is, a, is an excellent exemplar of this. In discussing the dynamic transformation of biting as in biting on a carrot, he thought this would be represented or stored as three schematic, sta schematic states. A mouth closed next to the object, followed by a mouth open, and then a mouth around the object. And of course, we can further break down those pictures into little features themselves, eyes, nose, mouth, circle. So I ask, really? Because we have a dynamic transformation of facial flow. Do we really think we're storing these transformations, these dynamic transformations as simply static states. The difficulty is there's no principled theory as to how or why the brain makes the selection into these elements that we saw in the previous picture, or which states or snapshots of the biting face are selected and stored, or in general, which elements of an event are stored, and how are these identified in principle? Which samples of the stored rotating cube would you store? Of the stored rotating cube, which samples? Remember, you can't actually take a sample and still specify the cube properly. In fact, biting on a carrot, as we saw, or a hamburger is a flowing transformation, a facial flow field. Now, for Barr, the details of the event can simply be reconstructed from the stored elements. How do you do this without storing the transformation? All of those transforms there we see in every one of those biting things is a detail. However, the abstractionist notion, the storage of static elements, a distillation is ubiquitous and deeply ingrained in theory to include ingrained in the predictive processing framework. So Barr, again, in this predictive context, notes Jennifer Freyd's representational momentum experiments. So in these experiments, a short series of frames, for example, of a rotating rectangle is presented. So up there on the left, I'm rotating my rectangle as a rectangle would rotate. But translated into a frame, there's a first frame, and each frame showing the rectangle rotated a bit more. And then the subject are asked later, did you see this particular rectangle? And so they're maybe shown one of the possible three there, or in reality, they're also shown this one. And this is their preferred memory, the preferred one that they saw. They tend to say they saw the, the last one, which is 
the next state of rotation. So for Barr, this suggests that the brain is generating an image of the next frame to be presented in support of, of the predictive notion. But these experiments are simply special cases of flows. The flag above is a flow field, and that flow field can be specified with precise slant values. And of course, I could do a same, the same type of experiment with a preferred memory of the a more rotated or more slanted flag. Jenkins et al. did a, a study with slides of a field flowing down the campus, or as I walk down the campus, a flow field. Six contiguous slides were left out. The subjects rejected these six as not seen. So in other words, they were showing a whole bunch of slides of this, of this, of this uh, campus as, it, as you flow down the campus, but there were six contigu contiguous slides not seen. Every time they were, seen, they were shown one of these slides is, did you, do you see, did you see this slide? They would say no. Or for that matter, they would, they would reject any slide not taken from the same perspective as this flow. But in effect, you have here a, a parameterization going on of flow field sensitivity or a sensitivity to flow fields. For example, one could ask, well, what if just one slide were missing from this flow? Is that still going to be rejected? Is it two slides? How sensitive we are to missing a chunk of the flow? That's the question. Or you could have presented frames of coffee stirring with its adiabatic ratios, that is energy of oscillation, the frequency of oscillation, its inertial tensors, its flow fields. And we're going to ask the standard question that is never asked. How are these dynamic forces and flows reduced? This is all just an example of dynamic flows and the brain's ability to pick up the invariance laws defined over these flows. It has nothing to do with prediction other than, than, than in that sense. It is not, none of this is is approving the predictive framework. So this again implies the brain is responding to dynamic structure of events with invariance over time. And that again, the predictive models must explain how these structures are faithfully encoded for future use. And this would include the principal method of the reduction of these events to elements or gist. I want to see the principled method. I want to see principles for this reduction. I'm tired of the baloney that we just say this happens. And then I have to see how these reduced structures are still sensitive to or support the parameterization of these cues. That is, I, for I can change the adiabatic ratio. I can change the inertial tensor. I can change the flow fields. I can, I can, I can as, as I say, all these have parameters involving the forces, the flows, et cetera, that can be changed. I want to see how these principal reductions into static elements now preserve that. Again, these models, the predictive models, are comparing or matching in an ongoing event a predictive or projected hypothesis on the form of the event against the actual ongoing event. This would require a far more concrete model of how such a comparison could actually work in real time for such a dynamically changing event. Imagine, for example, attempting to describe the nature of the ever-changing projected hypothesis or image, as well as the real-time matching process and at what scale, what time scale, each one-tenth of a second for the wobbly, plastically changing knot cube with its flowing fields, or for the rigid, non-rigid ellipse, or the coffee stirring with its adiabatic invariance, inertial tensors, and flows. 
I personally cannot begin to imagine how one would describe this process. So summing all this up, in, in, in my past life, as a technical architect and project manager in the systems world, in designing a system or a system architecture, there had eventually evolved over, over a dozen years, the formalism of use cases. These are various scenarios of what a system had to do. Like if I'm doing some sort of financial system, maybe like take a payment. How does that work? Or reverse a payment from two weeks ago, which is much harder given all the data that has to be stored. Or handle 50,000 transactions a minute or a second use cases. So you tended to start with a few simple cases just to get your mind going, to get a sketch of a possible system. But once you had that sketch in mind, you had to go, you very quickly had to go to the very toughest use cases or scenarios. The why? Because if your architecture cannot handle those use cases, it was useless. You had to trash it. You had to start all over. To me, this is precisely the problem with PP and others. I have been doing use cases here and just barely, I haven't really begun to do what I could do. But these are cases which PP does not even consider. They don't even consider the dynamics of events and how they'd handle that. That's the first stretch of their little architecture they'd have to deal with. What if they did? Would they reject? Would they start over? Interesting question. Now, rejecting an architecture is hard to bring oneself to do. And the whole connectionist framework and connectionist networks have evolved to what's termed a deep learning incarnation of these nets, where a deep learning network is a network with four or more layers. So it's in a way more of the same, but yet these networks with more and more levels nevertheless manifest more and more abilities as far as pattern learning. And the AI community is going full speed ahead, exploring this architecture's potential. And if you're wondering why I'm talking about this in predictive processing, it's because predictive processing is incorporated in deep learning networks or systems in general. Many impressive things are coming out in, the, in this deep learning framework. One can look or Google Demis Asabas, who is the CEO of Google slash deep learning. Um, now, this deep learning company that he created now part of Google. We're talking about networks, systems, because they're more than just networks that learn Atari games very quickly, become super experts at Atari. Uh, I saw discussed uh, a network slash system that watches videos and learns to cook. I put cook in quotes because I'm sure it's a quite a mechanical cooking. But it's hard not to be taken a, a bit aback by the apparent progress that's being made and the onslaught thereof. And this is all fine if it's seen as exploring practical applications, but the difficulty is this is all being taken as a theory of mind and therefore a theory of the human being. And therefore there's rather radical implications, difficult implications, if we take that as a model of ourselves and therefore of what ethics may be implied, etc. I think I've given throughout this series a whole lot of things that would, an armament, shall we say, that would allow people to look at all of this reporting about deep learning, et cetera, with, with a little bit of a larger perspective, look at it a little bit askance. And the major difficulty is 
Nevertheless, the deep learning art architecture, no matter how deep, will never handle perception. It has no explanation of the image of the external world. This in turn has profound implications for memory, for how memory is stored, if it is in the brain, imagination, the nature thereof, and cognition. This alone would compel me to reject the architecture, or at least try to put it in its proper place as, as a partial answer to what the brain is doing, but not to be going full bore explaining that I've got a full out theory of mind. But of course, Google DeepMind has 200 plus researchers and it is hiring. So the onslaught in this particular framework of machine mind is very difficult to withstand. D. Bergson has how many researchers? See, that's the problem. So PP has laid claims to explaining many illusions. Yet the optimal specification basis, as Weiss, Sibichan, and Adelson showed, for the rotating non-rigid ellipse and many others, the wobbly knot cube, and Weiss et al. could explain many illusions, already brings into question PP's actual usefulness and validity. Secondly, PP has no theory of perception that is the origin of the image of the external world. And without this, everything is ungrounded. At its base is a static world. It ignores dynamics, forces, and flows. At its base is the abstract, then reduce, distill, and store model of events. This model is littered with logical problems. I noted some of them in other discussions. I I believe in part four is one example, when you get into memory and real-time reconstruction of events. I think Bergson's own form of, of predictive processing is likely the far more powerful. And at its base is an actual model of the origin of the image of the external world. But until cognitive science jettisons the classic metaphysic in which it works, in which aids, abets, and promotes the abstract reduce, distill, and store, well, I don't think there's much hope of progress, real progress. So down the road, I'd like to again look at the problem of storing experience in the brain. That is how we take a nice two week long canoe trip with all its events and its richest of detail and store that within the brain. The um, subject includes the whole enchilada of hippocampal function theories, the role of the hippocampus. This relates to what's called consolidation of memories, fixing them in the brain and the process by which that is done supposedly. Connection of storage and consolidation models of which there are a good number and amnesia theoretics, theories of amnesia. This is a huge, complex, convoluted subject. And again, it all comes down to this. So what does it say for or against Bergson? The topic I broached previously that's called deep learning, and it's related, by the way, to predictive modeling Deep learning networks will incorporate predictive processing um, is an interesting one, and uh, I'm contemplating doing that again. And the whole notion of downloading consciousness versus Bergson is quite interesting. And though I don't like just critiquing things, they all bring out aspects of Bergson's theory, which are, I think, quite illustrative. And next, I think, I say I think, we'll look at inactivism, radical embodiment theories, some of Gibson's current exponents, 
and particularly simply why they fail as a cognitive theory. Till then, signing off.